and here we go. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Robert Vale. I'm Vice President of Sales here at Genia. Uh, we've got a great panel for you, uh, building access in a post-COVID-19 world. A uh, very relevant topic um, as everybody looks to start to go back to work, uh, need to understand exactly what needs to happen in the building. Um, we're here to offer some, uh, some guidelines and some things that we've been hearing from the industry. We've got some great industry experts uh, in terms of access control, um, a, in building, um, building hardware, as well as visitor management to really kind of walk you through the whole process to make a, a touchless environment as much as possible uh, as tenants begin to roll back into buildings. So, um, so I'll be the moderator of the panel today and we'll kind of get started here and kind of walk you through our agenda. So first thing we'll do is kind of give you um, some background on Genia. So for those of you who are not familiar with our company, I'll give you some just brief history on it, um, who we are, what we do, uh, and what we provide as an overall service. We'll walk through some of the biz biggest risk factors in today's access control environment. So what are things that you need to be uh, cognizant of as you look to reopen the buildings? We'll um, invite Emily Thrasher to talk about some changes in visitor management practices um, and things that you can do to um, you have some practical ways that you can make some adjustments to uh, visitors coming into sites. Um, and we'll walk through the access control portion of it um, with uh, Mike Maxeni and, and as well as Dan Danielle Ebner. Uh, at the end, we'll do some Q&A, um, and uh, we'll, we'll continue that way. So, so our panelists today, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike, Mike Maxeni, he's the co-founder of Secure. They're a cloud-based access control company based out of Atlanta. So for those of you who are longtime Genia customers, uh, you may be looking at the picture and wondering, who's this guy? We've never seen him before. Um, well, in December, uh, Genia actually acquired Mike's company. So now Secure is part of the Genia family. Um, and we are now in the access control business. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask Mike to go ahead and introduce himself, maybe get a little background. Um, Mike? Hey everyone, thanks Rob for the uh, quick introduction. Yeah, as Rob mentioned, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Secure, which is now Genia Access Control. Uh, we've been helping buildings and tenants automate security management for uh, over five years now. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here to uh, introduce some, some great uh, technologies and processes that you can deploy at your buildings uh, to create the touchless access journey. So thanks for having me. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you being here. Uh, another panelist uh, with us today from ProxyClick uh, is Emily Thrasher. She's Director of Global Commercial Accounts. Uh, Emily, uh, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Rob. Hi, guys. My name is Emily Thrasher, and I've been with ProxyClick Visitor Management for a little over two years. Um, I was actually introduced to ProxyClick from some tenants in my old building at Hudson Yards who were looking to utilize our system. So I learned a lot about visitor management needs from a tenant perspective uh, within the commercial space and then paired it what I knew uh, from the, from the uh, property management and technology point of view uh, and then ended up moving over to work with them and help establish uh, a little bit of their commercial vertical. So again, thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. Appreciate it. Uh, and our final panelist is uh, Danielle Ebner uh, from Smarter Security. She's the Director of Sales for the East Coast. Uh, Danielle, introduce yourself, please. Uh, yes. Hi, my name is Danielle. I've been with Smarter Security for a little over three years. Um, I came from product and integration. I've been in the industry for uh, 17. Um, but uh, thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody. Looking forward to hearing your parts of the presentation. Um, so, uh, once again, for those of you who missed my intro, my name is Robert Vale. I'm Vice President of Sales here at Genia. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our company, I'll give you a little bit of history now. So, uh, Genia is a uh, software company based in Southern California in Irvine. Uh, we've been selling our cloud-based access, um, cloud-based services for overtime HVAC, submeter billing, and access control for the past eight years. Um, we started initially with about 9 million square feet of office space utilizing our overtime HVAC service. And since then, we've grown to over 250 million square feet of office space across the country. Uh, our service is being used by over 4,500 companies uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world. Uh, we've got over 75,000 users. Uh, we have 99% customer retention at the building level. So as we work with uh, buildings, all, building teams all across the country, property teams um, change hands, buildings sell, uh, property management companies roll over on a regular basis, we stay with the buildings. And the big reason for that is because of our white glove approach to customer service. So we sell and we service direct. 
uh, and it's a very important part of our business, uh, which is the reason we have a net promoter score of 75. Um, we're, uh, we're working directly with building teams as well as their customers, meaning the tenants and buildings, and that trust goes a long way and means a lot to us. So we take a, a very white glove approach when it comes to customer service. Um, you get an idea of some of the companies who we work with, of the top 25 owners of commercial real estate in the United States. We work with 21 of them in some capacity and we're growing um, with each one of them um, all over the country. Of the buildings we're in, we're in buildings of all shapes and size, as small as 17,000 square feet and as large as One World Trade Center in New York City, which is well over 3 million square feet. Um, but this will give you an idea of you know, who we are, what we do. We have three main service offerings. Uh, so obviously today is going to be focused quite a bit on the access control, which is a newer addition to the Genia family. So as Mike mentioned, um, we acquired uh, Secure in December, and now we're rolling Secure into our entire platform of services. Um, but how we started our business is really with our overtime HVAC service. So uh, we have a software solution that allows us to connect to a building automation system. And from there, we allow tenants to request their own overtime HVAC whenever they need it from an app. I can pull up my app, turn on air till 10 o'clock. When service is rendered, we release the schedule um, and the normal schedule the building takes over. And from there, we do all the back end billing as well as um, integration into uh, work order systems uh, or accounting software to streamline the entire billing process. Um, we also uh, launched a second product um, about five years ago for submeter reading and billing. Uh, as we would fly around the country and visit our customers, we realized uh, more and more of them needed help with uh, streamlining the collection and billing process for submeters because normally it was engineers walking around once a month, writing down meter values and going to somebody on the property team, taking that to a spreadsheet to try and transpose numbers and figure out multipliers and create an invoice. And it was a very, um, a very laborious process with a lot of errors. So we created a software application to streamline that process. Um, we're now utilizing a smartphone app with asset tag stickers, um, and we're now reading and billing over 20,000 meters on a monthly basis across the country. Um, but like I said, today's focus is really going to be on access control and how to utilize uh, access control in, in, in an ecosystem to be uh, kind of the middleman to determine everything from uh, visitors coming into the building to tenants coming into the building, all the way from parking through uh, front door, through turnstiles, into elevators, and into the suite. So we're going to spend a lot of time on access control today. So, you know, one of the things, obviously, everybody's working from home right now. And, you know, why do we think that um, the office is not going to go away, right? Um, number one is, are you at home working with your children? Right? It's, um, I've got a four-year-old, I've got an eight-year-old, and I have a seven-month-old chocolate lab puppy. I really, really want to go back to work. Um, I love them to death, but um, it's a lot. It's a lot to try and homeschool, and I praise to my wife. She handles a lot of that, and I kind of help, but I'm not very good at it. Um, but, you know, we, I really want to get back to kind of normalcy and work, and I think kind of everybody in the country does, because, you know, what does your office do? It's, it's, it's where you go. Like, when you're going to work, it's someplace to go, and you feel a culture there. You get dressed up in your work attire. Um, and it's something to do every single day. You know what you do. You have a mission. You've got a place, and this is your time to work. It allows you to collaborate with your fellow employees. You know, as much as we're using Zoom like this and Teams and GoToMeeting, it's not really the same uh, as getting into the room with your fellow employees and having a whiteboard and having debates on what you should be doing, um, in, you know, for the company to help push it forward. Um, and it does create a sense of loyalty between the uh, you know, employer and the employee. We have, a, we have a beautiful office in Irvine, California at our headquarters that, you know, we, everybody takes very much pride in and being part of it and showing off our space. And, you know, you miss that. I haven't been there in, hell, it's been two months. Uh, so I kind of miss, you know, seeing the office and seeing how cool the place is to work. Um, you know, and it's, so it's a really big part of our livelihood, especially as adults um, and you're working, you know, most of your life. So it's a very big part of what we do. Uh, and it's just not going to go away. And, you know, and to our last point, like, seriously, like, you know, I got to leave. Um, and I have a feeling there's a lot of people who are ready just to kind of get out of the house. Like it doesn't have to be every day, but I mean, a couple of days a week is going to be very nice for a lot of people. So, um, but that's, you know, that's why we're going to go, you know, we think the office is not going to go away well. Now, the, obviously the reason that we're all here today is because there's some changes that need to happen because business as usual is not the case anymore. So when you look at the overall kind of risk factors in terms of how commercial real estate and office environments have been operating for years, you know, there's a lot of things that we just, because of this, the COVID-19 environment, we just can't do anymore. So if you look at, you know, there's always been too many touch points at the building. And, and 
And, you know, what do I mean by that? Like, like I'm a good example. So for the past eight years, I fly around the country and I go to office buildings. I walk all over the place in the office buildings because I know where I'm going. I walk in, I go to security, I touch everything. I put my hands on the counter. I talk to them. I shake hands. I go to multiple floors just as I like to check things out, um, you know, and I'm touching buttons all over the place. Like I'm a prime example of what I shouldn't be doing. Uh, you know, and when it comes to just anybody else as well, like you have visitors come in and there's shared iPads at the front desk or a shared kiosk and everybody's got dirty little fingerprints all over the place. And you, you just can't have that anymore. Uh, you can't have close interactions with the, with the building staff as much as we want to because we miss that, you know, in order to be careful and to take care of each other, uh, we just can't really do that anymore. And that even comes to you know, access control, you know, the, the amount of times we touch the door handles, we push the common elevator buttons, uh, everything that you think about when you go and approach a building or any office, there's a lot of things that you touch. And that causes a lot of risk in this environment. So we really need to try and strive to get to a touchless environment. Uh, that's what we really want to get to. So overall, the goal for this webinar is we want to highlight, you know, some of the operational technological changes for protecting employees, building staff and visitors in, in a post COVID world. Right. So obviously, you know, we're going to give you a kind of a roadmap of what you could get to. Now, there are huge considerations to take when uh, deploying anything new. Right. You, do you have the capital to do it? Uh, will your ownership group allow you? What's the return on investment? You know, is it practical? Can you even do it because your building um, is your building set up to support some of these nuances? So we're going to just show you kind of, you know, here's a roadmap of what you could get to with the understanding that you may not be able to do it all now. Uh, but there are we're also trying to give you some very practical things as well to do. Now, are, there are some times where you do have to make an investment, whether it be into software or some hardware to make some of these changes take place. And obviously there's a business decision that you have to make, but our goal today is really trying to give you a framework and then, you know, you guys can choose based upon your buildings and your environment, what works best for you. So, so you know, here's, here's kind of the goal, right? Is to have a touchless journey from credentialing, meaning getting setting somebody set up in the access control system or the visitor management system remotely. No longer are our office managers going to be sending to an employee, here's a form, fill out a form, hand me that form, I'm going to touch it, and I'm going to walk it down to the property management office, they're going to touch it, and they're going to take that stuff and key it into a database, right? That's just, that's going away. How do we streamline that process so it's done either via an app or through a cloud-based system? Uh, from parking. We no longer want people pulling tickets if they don't have to. We don't want take people taking their HID cards and touching anything. Hell, we don't even want the cards anymore because that means you're sharing something. So we want to make really the streamline from credentialing to getting into the building, then going from the front, from parking to the front door. How do we want to make it so that you can do get all the way through the door to the elevators without touching a lot uh, and make it also so it doesn't slow things down? Because that's the last thing you want as well is to cause a traffic jam when you have a very busy building and a lot of people coming in. Like, how do you also make it so it's efficient that they get to work, but also be safe? And all the way through the elevators, right? We don't want people going to the elevators and lighting it up like a Christmas tree and touching all the buttons. Like, what, what are some practical ways that we can help on the elevator side and then all the way to the suites? Uh, how do you get doors opened in a way where not, you're not sharing a lot of germs and people aren't doing that? So, so obviously, this is the goal of where to get to. There's a lot of parts to this. Um, so as we go through this, don't, don't be afraid. There's going to be a lot of content that we throw at you guys. Obviously, this is going to be recorded. We're sharing it with you. And, of course, we can help on anything. But I just want to kind of give you the idea of where you can get to. And when we look at this from, from the Genia side, one of the things that's kind of the, the central part of this is really when you look at the access control system. So access control kind of connects everything. It connects with video. It connects with video man uh, visitor management. Uh, there's this whole support function of how do you take care of the tenants in the building? How do you take care of any users who are coming in uh, at different times of day? Uh, how do you help with credentialing for both visitor management and um, as well as access control? How do you connect everything to elevators and parking? So if you kind of look at where we're at in terms of Genia, we like to look at we're kind of in the middle of all this and we're connecting all the parts. And that's part of the reason we bring our partners here because there's some things that we don't do uh, at all. 
uh, but we have you know incredible partners who do things very very well and we want to um, to work with them and give them as a resource for you to be able to say okay we're going to roll out a technology to the building to make everything seamless and touchless uh, who can we trust to work with so that everything is to the benefit of the site as well as to all the tenants and visitors coming in and, and that's our goal overall as a company so so the first thing that we start with is uh, is visitor management so we're taking a look from you know from the from somebody coming in to visit the building and so with that i'm going to go ahead and pass it over to emily and emily give you some background on proxy click and walk you through the visitor management process thank you rob uh, so for proxy click we work with uh, some of the largest asset managers um, at their buildings uh, such as the grace building in midtown new york hudson square in lower manhattan brooklyn navy yard which is a 300 acre campus in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and then we're in the lobby of 10 Hudson Yards with L'Oreal. Uh, along with some of the brands you see here, you might be part of this brand or you might see some of your tenants. Um, and as I mentioned before, many times these tenants are the ones bringing us into their building. Uh, they're the ones introducing us to their property manager or owner operator. And we really start to bridge that gap between uh, you know, bringing visitors or people into your building um, for your tenants. However, we've taken a little bit different approach here lately, just because a lot of people are asking about uh, how do we get all people into your building. So I'll talk, I'll touch a little bit more on who qualifies as a visitor a little bit later. Um, and as Rob said, integration with partners is key. So we have a uh, an open API that allows each building and each tenant to really choose their own experience and be able to enhance that experience the way that they want it um, and then also allow the building to kind of take control if they want or allow the tenants a little bit more freedom. Uh, ProxyClick is a cloud-based system that has been around for over 10 years uh, and we really started with laying the groundwork at the very very beginning for any situation that may arise and impact your building. Um, we really focus on security, efficiency, compliancy, and brand, and are consistently delivering features that are not only the nice to haves and the bells and whistles as we call them, uh, but they really do keep your property management team, your owner operators providing a valuable solution for their tenants. Uh, we provide an easy dashboard and access for your security staff. Um, and then we do love to work with your tenants and ensure that they're having, you know, the best experience that they can with visitor management. So, as I mentioned, what is a visitor? And we define visitors as anyone entering your building at this point. Uh, things have changed lately. We've been hearing over and over, how do we get our employees in? How do we have them answer questions just like visitors? Um, we're already set up to do that. The lobby is truly being transformed from a space uh, that used to have a paper logbook on the desk, uh, one that everyone saw. And I used to sign my name Mickey Mouse every time I walked into a lobby in New York um, to a freestanding kiosk, as Rob mentioned, with a more maybe concierge approach. We've been talking about hospitality for the last couple of years. And I, I don't think that's going away. Um, maybe the handshake version will be for a while, but um, you know, now we're really talking about how do we keep everyone coming in the building from touching or talking to anyone. And that's different. That's a different approach. Uh, things are never be maybe normal again, but what's the new normal? So thankfully, we are prepared for this approach. And we do partner with other companies that think along the same lines. So whether you're looking to ensure that your delivery drivers um, are coming into the loading dock and, and they're registered and they can get access to your tenant level safely uh, from your janitorial staff that may need to check in every single time as well. Um, to just welcoming employees from other locations or, or just plain visitors coming in for a job interview. Um, you know, we have all different kinds of flows to get everyone into your building safely and as touchless as possible. Whereas the old days, aka four months ago, you may have been checking state IDs and handing out plastic badges. Uh, your key to providing a smooth lobby transformation is, is kind of as you see here. So let's talk pre-registration because that truly is key to getting people into your building safely. Um, my main suggestion to you is to allow your tenants and their employees to use your visitor management system. I've heard so many issues about operations going wrong because they have their tenants 
emailing at security desk, they're updating a, an Excel spreadsheet and shipping it off each night. What happens when that inbox doesn't get checked? Or what happens when that Excel doesn't get updated in the most timely fashion? Uh, not having a real-time approach to visitor management creates an operational inefficiency that can really be avoided. Um, each tenant can have their own account. Each employee only sees their own visitors. Um, there's no commingling of data with ProxyClick, which keeps your data security team very happy and allows each person to be personally accountable for the people that they are inviting into the building. So that pre-registration is key. Your visitors get an email saying, um, you know, welcome to the location. It gives them a map. It gives them who their host is. Uh, it gives them a little bit more information and it really starts the journey for that visitor coming onto your site. Uh, the next thing is a pre-check for visitors on their own personal device. And I'll actually show you a demo uh, a little bit later, but having visitors answer questions prior to their meeting is crucial for like a seamless flow um, and keeps them uh, active in this journey with you. Whether it's about COVID or whether it's about something else, this pre-check-in is something that I think will be key moving forward. And then lastly, integration. So it's key for buildings with turnstiles and destination dispatch. Uh, we have an open API, as I mentioned, to integrate with great partners like Secure for, uh, Secure for access control and destination dispatch. Uh, visitors QR code becomes active at a certain amount of time before their meeting. They can walk directly to the turnstile, scan that QR code, get their destination dispatch uh, elevator pass, um, they can, the host can be notified at the same time that their visitor is on the way up or employees are on their way up to their floor. Um, and then of course, everything is just done seamlessly so that that visitor doesn't have a stop uh, or a bottleneck in their, in their journey. This can also start at the parking, uh, parking system as well. That's something that we've also integrated with to even you know, get visitors and employees in pr uh, prior to the lobby level. If your building doesn't have turnstiles, um, we've been speaking with a ton of buildings that they just don't have this in place right now, and, th and that's okay. We, we all know that there's budgetary, budgetary constraints. A few things that we've learned is that the pre-registration process and the pre-check process is still key for your building. Um, that QR code can still be used in a touchless way to trigger a check-in flow that will also <laughs> alert your host, which I think is critical. Um, and then, you know, ProxyClick actually hosted a webinar last week where we learned uh, Hudson Yards will have their um, ambassadors pushing the elevator button since they don't use destination dispatch on some of the buildings. And another client we work with said they'd be passing out hand wipes uh, for certain buildings and uh, to wipe down the elevator buttons. And we do it at the gym. Why can't we do it at a building? Again, it's changing the new normal. So. I'm going to ask for permission to show you our pre-check-in flow. All right, so as I mentioned, pre-check-in for, you know, specifically for COVID right now is very important, but I don't think that's going to change in the future. This can actually be work uh, be used for anything that's coming up within your building. This can be specific to your tenant. Um, basically, it's an outline of what the visitor will expect. They start their registration. Um, it says, due to the recent coronavirus outbreak, you know, the, your company has implemented processes for all employees and visitors when visiting any uh, facility. Please read carefully and answer questions. Have you been in contact? Yes or no? We're going to say no just for this. Do you have any of the following symptoms? No. You're going to submit your responses. Each tenant or each building can have visitor instructions and confidentiality agreements. Sign the agreement. And then you're registered. This QR code is the one that I've been speaking of that can become active once that visitor is, is in your lobby. And you can actually use this directly on the turnstile. So no printing of a badge if you don't want. Um, and it's easy to add to your Apple wallets and Android uh, wallet as well. So, you know, we tried to make everything as simple as possible. And as Rob said, uh, you know, what have we learned thus far? Don't worry, you don't have to take notes. Uh, we are going to give you a brief summary of this. 
uh, at the end and, and key takeaways on each section. So pre-registration is key. Um, you know, it really ensures that your team, your building and your tenants know who is coming into your lobby. Um, adopt and love QR codes. We, we've seen, I've seen all over LinkedIn today about QR codes and, and what's going to happen and who's, who's using them. It's really a great way of using QR codes and not having people download a separate app if they don't want to. Um, be okay with eliminating the shared tablets for now um, and understand aesthetics may change if you need to put plexiglass in between your staff and your visitors. Uh, sorry, Rob, no more propping your elbows up on the counter as you go in, <laughs> uh, at least for a while. So hopefully this has been helpful. Thank you so much, Emily. That's very, very helpful. Great information. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, and now what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and hand it over to uh, Mike Maxeni, uh, once again, the co-founder of Secure, uh, and which is now Genia's access control company. So Mike, jump on in. Great. Thanks, Rob. Hey, everyone. Uh, Emily, thank you so much for a great walkthrough on visitor management. Uh, I'm excited to talk about a few things with access control. We're going to break it out into procedural changes as well as technological changes. Um, and I wanted to have a focus for, uh, for our buildings to talk about things that are both low cost or no cost. Uh, and then we'll, we'll layer in some more advanced um, technologies and things that you can implement that are a little more expensive. Um, so with that said, uh, we're gonna go ahead and talk about some procedural changes that you can implement the building uh, at almost no cost. So one is that um, you're probably already doing this, but it's just a good reminder that, especially in the near term to mandate uh, PPE. So just make sure everyone's wearing a, a mask as they're coming through the lobby. Um, that's, that's one of the easiest ways that you can help protect everyone. Uh, we all have masks now, or at least I hope we do. Uh, and so this should be a fairly easy step. Um, two is that work with your tenants, help them keep out uh, their employees that are sick, right? So if anyone has a cough or a sore throat, it's just easier for them to stay home. We've all been working from home for at least six weeks now. So um, staying at home while you're sick is just a, a great way to make sure that uh, you're not taking undue risk for, for your building and your tenants. Um, th three is that keeping amenity spaces like gyms or shared conference spaces uh, closed for the, for the short term might be a great idea uh, until we sort of all figure this out as a country. Um, so as you're opening up your building, right, letting people leverage their offices again, keeping those amenity spaces closed for the short term uh, be, be a great step. Um, four is create a queuing area for the elevator, right? Um, instead of having, you know, huge crowds of people jammed into an elevator lobby, make sure that there's a queuing system. Uh, and one of the things that are, uh, we're seeing in a lot of buildings is they're keeping hand sanitizer stations um, in those elevator lobbies just to uh, make sure that people have access to, to hand sanitization uh, as they're entering the building, uh, especially if they have to touch any elevator buttons. And then five, another strategy that we're seeing with portfolios like Boston Properties and others is staggering entry times based on, um, uh, based on floor groups. Um, so staggering entry times is a procedural change that costs nothing but uh, can help you limit the amount of people that are going through those entry points at the same time uh, which again reduces risk for your tenants and your building um, so that those are some easy procedural changes now we're going to switch over to some of the, the technological things that you can implement um, now What's really important to talk about is how you're gonna manage all this technology, right? With, with a lot of um, portfolios of buildings, if you have a lot of on-prem systems, if you can create policies, you can implement technology, but if you don't have a centralized way of managing it, it's gonna be very challenging, especially if you have a single property team or a single IT team that's responsible for a, a wide network of buildings and systems. Um, so, so this is where we're gonna talk about the, the benefits of having a cloud-based system, right? So, uh, with a cloud-based system, it's the easiest way for you to enforce procedural and systematic changes for access management. Um, if you're going to implement um, staggered entry times um, or mobile access credentialing, it's really important to have a cloud-based system so that you can enforce that remotely uh, while enabling your property teams to manage the building and pull data uh, while not having to be on site in a basement somewhere. Um, 
what we've seen is for a lot of our customers, right, having to take their property teams and move off site temporarily, um, the ability to remotely lock and unlock doors, change or remove settings, uh, add or remove users, right, having that remote management is key. Um, and of course, if you're going to implement some new policies and procedures, having the ability to remotely get notifications uh, from your system rather than having to build custom email servers or VPNs to, to access the system. Uh, again, super important to have a cloud-based system. We're, of course, biased about this um, because we're a cloud-based platform, but we really think that you're moving off of an on-prem system into the cloud gives you so much more flexibility and control. Um, and that also enables the next slide, which is uh, mobile access, right? So a lot of our customers are, are coming to us now asking about how can I implement mobile access to eliminate shared credentials and, sh and, and touching of readers. So uh, of course, with mobile access, it's not a shared device. You're using your own phone uh, to, to access the building rather than a, a credential that your building staff has to hand to someone or that, uh, tenants have to share internally with their employees. Um, so having your own device to access the building is really important. Um, it's also really important for us is that uh, is as we're talking about implementing more convenient and touchless technologies um, to not sacrifice security. So with mobile access, you get both. You get greater convenience, you get the health benefits of not having to have a common touch point at a reader uh, or a shared key card or fob. Um, so, but you also don't sacrifice security. Uh, these credentials can't be shared, they can't be copied, they can't be stolen, like a physical key card. Um, so that's, that's really important. And then uh, another great benefit is that you can remotely provision these keys with a single click. It doesn't matter if you're managing a building a thousand miles away or right down the street, um, having the ability to click a button, give a credential to a new vendor or a new tenant, uh, really easy to, as well. So greater convenience, greater security, and you have a touchless access experience at every entry point. So whether it's the elevator, the turnstile, or the suite door, or even the parking deck, um, having a, a touchless credential across all those entry points uh, is going to make it really convenient and easy for you to implement uh, a healthier uh, entryway. So um, I'm going to show you real quick how the mobile access system works. Uh, one is that you can simply tap the phone to the reader. Uh, of course, we, we recommend using the next method, which is to twist and go. So whether it's a parking deck or a lobby door, you can simply walk up, twist the phone, and it'll unlock the door for you. Um, or you can use a wearable like an Apple Watch. Um, what I usually do is when I'm driving into the office in the morning, I'll just touch my watch app and it'll unlock the door for me, uh, or the gate, excuse me. So uh, again, this is all about enabling touchless access, uh, and you can do that quite easily with mobile. Um, last note on that is that we, uh, we, all, we support both HID mobile inside of our platform, as well as now proxy mobile. So you have two different options for enabling mobile access. Um, so of course, the one issue with mobile access is that, yeah, sure, we're not touching a reader, but then what happens if you have to touch a door handle? It doesn't really solve the problem. So we wanted to give, these are very low cost things that you can implement at a door. Uh, one is the wrist handle operated uh, handle. Uh, you simply grab it with like your elbow, and pull the door open. Uh, the most hygienic one is just a foot pedal. Um, so that uh, if you install a foot pedal at your door, you simply badge in at the door, the door will release, and then you grab the door with your foot um, so that there really is no touching uh, from an arm or, or a, a hand. Um, these are both very low cost. So these devices should cost you less than, well, well less than $100, and they're easy to install. You can have your building engine, uh, engineers install them uh, so you don't have to pay a third party integrator or uh, a contractor to do that. Again, I want to give some low cost options that are hygienic and easy to implement for buildings. Uh, we're going to include links to these products as well in the follow up email. So don't worry about taking notes or Google searching right now. Um, now, that's the low cost way. Uh, the more advanced way is to have an automatic door opener. Uh, now, do automatic door openers come in a, a number of different uh, form factors. You can have them concealed inside the frame of the door, uh, or you could have one that's exterior mounted. And depending on the type of door, uh, your install cost is gonna range between around uh, 
two thousand to seven thousand um, dollars, depending on the function of the door. If it's a double door, um, there's a lot of different factors that go into that, and then also um, the the labor costs associated with installing those devices is, is obviously much more expensive than simply uh, uh, drilling a, a foot pedal or a hand pedal onto the door. Um, so just be aware of what they can potentially cost, but there are, you know, this is a great way for you to simply walk up to the door, twist your phone, and then have the doors unlock. At our office building in Irvine, um, that's what you do. You just walk up, twist the phone, doors open. Um, so this is also, of course, ADA friendly. Um, so moving beyond door openers, I want to introduce Daniel Ebner from Smarter Security to talk about um, how you can have touchless turnstiles in your building and then also talk about uh, occupancy counting and occupancy enforcement. Um, so Danielle, take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. Hi everyone, I just wanna give you a brief overview on Smarter and then talk about some of our products. Um, so Smarter's been number one in the US eight out of the past 10 years. We secure 50% of Fortune 100 companies. Uh, we have over 10,000 installs on six continents. Um, Two of our main products um, are both the door detective and the turnstiles. Um, and just to, to circle back, some of our main customers, uh, we have all different types of businesses that use turnstiles. So it's not just class A lobbies. Um, we do have like Towers 3, 4, and 7, a World Trade or Hudson Yards, but we do things like higher ed, Notre Dame, um, financial services, social media, oil and gas. We have, um, places like Netflix or Facebook. Um, so a lot of different, whether it's a tenant or a building, there's still ways to use turnstiles and when they don't fit, we have the door detective. Um, so I'll go on to the turnstile slide. So turnstiles are great for an entrance because they're very fast. They process 60 people per minute. So you don't have people you know, stuck uh, waiting in the queue to get through. And turnstiles can utilize CS readers, Bluetooth readers, completely touchless. So Having your phone, like Mike said, you, you do your twist and shake, walk right through. Um, same with QR scanners, turnstiles now. Uh, we had some people that were buying, you know, paper ticket insert that has kind of gone away. Everyone is looking for a service mount QR reader that you can just walk up to with your phone. Um, we do Ingham chassis integration with different biometrics, um, whether that be hand geometry readers, like you see in this photo uh, at Slack. Um, we have facial recognition, um, just a lot of different options. Uh, any biometric can be put in um, to make it also touchless. Uh, we have definitely seen an uptick in destination dispatch, um, elevator displays. So they're built right into the turnstile. So whether you're a visitor or a tenant and you're showing your card, the display is in the turnstile itself. And as you're walking through, it's telling you what elevator to get into, uh, kind of helping eliminate touching buttons in the elevator. The turnstiles themselves accurately log uh, all entry and exit for occupancy counting. So even if you don't have people reading card out, you're still getting an accurate count of who's gone in and who's gone out. Um, they're IP enabled, low voltage. Um, so just, you know, they have data in there that your access control can use for all different types of things, um, as well as your building automation system. And because they're turnstiles and everybody wants to look like they're in a beautiful office, but feel very secure, they can come in all different kinds of design aesthetics, colors, finishes, um, just tons of options. For the door detective, the door detective is a really cool little device. Um, it's an anti-tailgating device and it sits on the door frame. Um, it sends information to your access control system and it can be help, help used, uh, used for population counting. Um, so if you are in a city that is requiring um, reduced occupancy, this can really help manage that in conjunction with your access control system. So just like a turnstile, it counts people in and out. Um, this can read direction. So even if you have people in an area, um, it can count them leaving and entering. So if you are at occupancy or close to occupancy, it can send a notification to your access control system just letting them know that you know, no one else can come in until somebody leaves. And it can also do that if they're not reading out. Um, it can be also mounted in a hallway or another narrow area. So even if you don't have a door, it can still count people going through. Um, they're IP enabled and PoE powered. And you know, again, because everybody likes a pretty look, it can be made in any color or finish depending on what you want it to look like. 
Um, I think that's the, the basis of it, um, but I'll send it back to Mike to talk about elevators. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Yeah, so, you know, obviously occupancy counting uh, is critically important. You can, you can enforce occupancy a lot of different ways with the, the door detective integrated into the, uh, the Genia access control platform, uh, either just through notification of occupancy violations or through uh, enforcement. Uh, so if you have too many people in a given area uh, that you can then restrict access to any new entrance. Um, so, so Danielle, thank you so much for, for taking us through that. Um, now, moving to the next you know, set of entryways, which is the elevator. When you've gotten through the door you, at the lobby, uh, you're now through the, the turnstile at the building. Um, now, one of the most common things that we're hearing from a lot of customers is talking about how can we make elevators touchless? Um, so good news and bad news on this front. Um, good news is that if you have a destination dispatch system, um, you have a couple options to enable touchless. So one is that most destination dispatch systems have a home floor assignment um, that you can give to every single person in the system. So when they credential into the system, uh, then they will automatically be assigned a cab based on their, their office floor. Um, so we really encourage you to leverage that if you're not already doing that today. Uh, another thing is that um, you can have a, a staff member from the building, like Emily was talking about at Hudson Yards, simply make that elevator uh, a, a choice for people. Instead of having every single guest to the building selecting their floor on a kiosk, um, simply having the building people do that uh, will really help. Now, the third thing is that we are now working on deploying a, a, an enhancement to our destination dispatch integration that will allow uh, in-app floor selection. So if you have tenants with multiple floors in your building, uh, it, you can't really rely on the, the home floor assignment. So we're now working on a way for um, uh, the user to be prompted as soon as they credential in at a door or at a turnstile to then select the, which floor on the elevator they want to go. So when they do that elevator floor selection in our application, it'll assign them a cab and take them to the floor that they need to go to. Um, so that's, that's on destination dispatch side. The, uh, the relay based elevator side is where we're, we're, we're still doing a lot of homework on how can we make this a touchless experience. Um, because of the way relay based elevators work, uh, this is going to be a much more challenging problem to solve. Um, so one of the quick things that you can do today that's really low cost is to install a wave activated um, call button at the elevator lobby. Uh, this requires uh, almost no additional wiring. It's using the same cable that's there behind the call button today. Um, you're simply replacing that with a wave activated button instead of a uh, pushing uh, push button. Uh, this, this should cost no more than $500 to implement. Um, the devices themselves usually cost around 80 to hundred dollars. You can buy them from multiple distributors. Um, your building engineers could probably install them if not any low voltage technician. Um, so hand activated buttons. Now the problem is that that doesn't take care of the selection inside the cab. Um, inside the cab, what you can do is again, have a member of the building staff select the elevator floors. If you want to at least limit the amount of people who are touching those buttons. Um, or you can just uh, uh, sanitize the, the, those buttons you know, a couple times a day uh, to again limit or reduce the risk uh, for people riding the elevators. So um, unfortunately, right, relay-based elevators are much more challenging, but uh, we do have a great solution for destination dispatch. So uh, on, on the next slide, we'll show you how that looks, right? So when you badge in, uh, whether it's at a door at the lobby level or a turnstile going into the elevator lobby, we'll be able to select which reader you want to prompt the user to select their floor after. So whether it's, the, let's say it's a turnstile, um, if you're walking through, you badge in at the turnstile using your guest QR code, or you're using your, your Jamia mobile access application, uh, or some sort of touchless biometric like a face ID or a, a, a morpho hand uh, identifier. Either based on the entry point, we will then prompt you to select the floor in the app. Once you make the floor selection, it will assign you uh, a cab to take you to your, the, your desired floor. Um, so it's a very basic application. We're just basically manipulating the home floor assignment uh, 
behind the destination dispatch system. Um, so we hope to have that available in the next couple months. Uh, we're working on it right now, so stay tuned. Um, the next is thermal cameras. We keep hearing about thermal cameras. Um, so what, what I really want to do with the next two slides is just sort of ground the conversation in a, in a bit of reality. Um, there's a lot of hype out there around thermal cameras and deploying them, um, but there are some practical limitations, uh, both technologically and procedurally, um, that I want to highlight. Before I get into that, there's a few different types of thermal cameras that you can implement. There's wall-mounted uh, cameras, there are handheld cameras, and then there are kiosk based cameras uh, that you can, it's basically like a small iPad, you can mount it on a security desk or on a pedestal like you see in this picture. Uh, we're seeing, we're starting to see different people use all different types of form factors. Uh, the, the, the pedestal kiosk is, is more popular at the tenant level um, as well as handheld cameras. But um, so let's talk about some of those, those uh, things that I was mentioning earlier, right? Practical limitations. Um, before you go out and spend $2,000, $5,000, $7,000 on a camera, um, let's just, I, we're really encouraging caution and, and, and critical thinking here. So, so one is, uh, if, just be aware of some of the limitations with the thermal camera. The way a thermal camera works is it's scanning your surface temperature of your body. It is not scanning internal temperature. Um, so, so when you go to the doctor's office, there's a reason that they ask you to sort of go, ah, and they stick the thermometer under your, under your tongue because they're trying to get as close to an internal body temperature as possible. With thermal cameras, it can really only read skin deep. Um, so if you're walking around in a hot area like Phoenix, Arizona, or Houston, Texas, or downtown Manhattan, you know, April through uh, September, you're gonna be naturally hotter on your surface, whether it's sunny outside or just amb there's ambient temperature. Uh, so, so how do you protect against that, right? Um, what, what some people are doing is creating wary, waiting areas. Now, the problem with waiting areas is a couple, couple things. One is, uh, the most obvious is that it, it really reduces the throughput in your lobby and can create unnecessary crowding. And uh, right now, we're all trying to reduce the unnecessary crowding. We want people to move quickly and not be clumped together in tight groups. Um, so if you're going to implement a thermal camera, we want you to think about, you know, how would you deploy this in your building or your office before you go out and spend a lot of money and implement this. Um, so th those are the kind of things that we want to highlight. Uh, just wanted to you know give give some practical uh, some knowledge here around thermal cameras. So with that said, uh, uh, I'm going to wrap it up with some key takeaways for access control. I want to leave a few minutes for Q and A here. So um, easy, low cost solutions are install those foot and elbow operated door openers, uh, leveraging mobile access and mobile credentialing. Uh, is a great way to reduce common touch points. Mandatory PPE, um, that should be a no-brainer for everybody. Uh, and then staggered start times, um, that's another great way. Um, just group your floors together, say, you know, floors five through 10, you guys come in this, in this hour block, you know, 10 through 15 come in the next hour block. Um, that's gonna be a great way to reduce the amount of people getting jammed into common areas at the same time. More advanced solutions again, right? Install a cloud-based system. Um, to enable all these integrated technologies. So um, uh, Emily and ProxyClick are great partners at, at, um, for visitor management. Um, those QR codes for access through the turnstile uh, or into the destination dispatch system, all that's integrated through our platform so that we can enable um, touchless access experiences for not just your guests, but also for the tenants of the building. Um, so, once you do that, you can install automatic door openers and main entrances, uh, upgrade your destination dispatch and make sure that everyone has a home floor assignment so that at the very least, they, you're reducing the amount of times people have to touch a common kiosk and then use a density counter. Um, there, uh, you know, like, like Danielle pointed out with the, uh, the, the door detective product, um, this is a great way to know how many people are in your building at any given time and then enforce reduced occupancy mandates. Um, so those are some of the more advanced things that you can do with your building. Um, so yeah, that's it uh, on that slide.
again, we're the platform that can make all this possible for you. If you have uh, a, a system today that is on-prem, we're offering a special uh, to for, during this time. If you have anything that's Mercury-based, we are now offering the ability to upgrade a Mercury-based system to a cloud-based Jamia access control system uh, at no cost. Um, one caveat there is it won't include mobile access upgrades if you don't have uh, HID multi-class readers, but if you do have a Mercury-based system, we can at least get you off the on-prem access control system into a cloud-based system. So with that said, I'm gonna wrap it up and open up for Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A and we're happy to uh, answer any questions. Yep, so uh, thanks, Mike. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, wonderful presentation uh, for those of you still on. Like I said, there's a Q&A in your, uh, your home screen there on Zoom. Feel free to type in any questions. We'll stay on for a couple more minutes. Um, of course, if you want to talk to anybody separately um, or want a special, want to have a one-on-one -on -one demo with either Mike uh, or Danielle or Emily, uh, feel free to reach out to myself. I'll help coordinate. You can email to sales at getchenia.com and we can go ahead and coordinate with anybody you like. Um, we're, we're all already available and obviously we're all at home, so we're doing a lot more meetings. So uh, we're available to speak with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, hold on one second. We have a question from Jessica uh, Higgins. Have you implemented this in any federal buildings? Visitors need to go through uh, magnetometers. Uh, magnetometers. <laughs> I just butchered that. Butchered that. Um, I'm going to assume this one goes to. Um, that one's for Emily. That was Emily. Emily. Yeah. Don't make me say that word. <laughs> I was butchered. Uh, so we were rolled out at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to check to see if they have that uh, magno magnometer uh, <laughs> in or after. Um, I honestly don't think it matters. I think most federal buildings or any type of government. Uh, building that has visitors going through that first. It's literally right inside the door. So if that's instead of a turnstile, then visitors actually go through the magnometer and then uh, do the check-in operational flow that the building has instilled. So um, however, if they want to do it first, that's also an option. There's not really a difference to us. Uh, we are rolled out in uh, some government facilities. So we can definitely check to see what the best flow would be. Okay, perfect, thank you. And then um, question from uh, Shell Cento, uh, do you have a dual factor confirmed for an access eventually forced by a skimmer use? Mm. Mike, I'm gonna assume that's for you, maybe dual factor uh, authentication uh, for access control. Yeah, so we do two factor authentication. Um, primarily right now it's using uh, pin codes. Um, so that's, uh, if you're looking for touchless, uh, pin codes are not a great option. Um, not, I'm not sure what a skimmer is. Um, so whoever asked that, uh, Michelle, if you could, if you could clarify what the skimmer is, uh, I could probably answer that better for you. And then maybe you can, Mike, you can talk about dual factor for the app. Ah, uh, yeah. So two factor authentication using the application. So, um, of course, Right with a with a mobile app, we can have two factor authentication turned on so that the if you try to touch the, the phone to the reader or use Twist and Go, uh, it will not activate the reader until the phone is unlocked. So you can use facial identification, touch identification, or a pin code to unlock your phone, and then the credential will be released to the reader. So that is a great way of doing two factor authentication to verify a user's identity as well. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Let's see. All right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so Michelle is, is in case someone uh, stole your, your card, you'll receive a confirmation for access. Yeah. <clears throat> so we don't have uh, we don't have two FA on the card, but we do have it on mobile. So it's another another great benefit of, of mobile access is that you have two factor authentication on the credential. Um, so we really encourage using mobile access. Wonderful. Thank you, Mike. Um, let's see, we might have one more comment that's uh, answered her question. So thanks again. Um, and with that, I want to say we're here at the uh, at the end of our time. Um, once again, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Danielle. Of course, thank you, Mike, for uh, for everything. 
once again, for the audience, uh, this is um, being recorded and as part of the follow-up email, you'll have a, uh, a link to the video uh, as well as a copy of the deck that you can download. Uh, but for anything that you may need from uh, anybody here on the presentation, feel free to reach out to myself or anybody here and we will coordinate as appropriate. So thanks everybody for your time. Um, have a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.